this talk out a few times, and it's taken at least 29 minutes every time. So this morning I added some more slides to kind of help the challenge a little bit. Um, that means I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. I hope you'll pay attention. Uh, if you don't, the slides will be on later. And, like you'll read everybody's great tweets probably or something. Uh, all right, so production testing through monitoring. I find this title a little bit amorphous and ambiguous, and I'm not sure what it means, even though I'm doing the talk on it, but that maybe is concerning. I thought of a different way I might describe this. Um, some thought this might be a little bit aggressive, or you know, maybe like offensive people or whatever. Uh, so I don't know if you want to take this as the title, um, but I find monitoring is very much like testing, but you do it in production, so it's actually important, right? Um, if you actually need to go back and tell your boss what we talked about here today, like this is here at Spec Conference, and we're all like, you know, better ourselves as people. Uh, so let's say that we're going to do this, right? So there's a discussion on the trade-offs between testing and monitoring and how to apply them in the DevOps lifecycle. That has enough buzzwords that I'll be able to convince any management if you need to come back next year, that, that should work for you. Right? So, so you pick the title that you want and then we'll move forward. Uh, who am I? Uh, so as mentioned, I do organize for uh, both actually DC and Baltimore DevOps. Um, basically, I spent my career building big systems, internet-facing web systems, and helping other people do that kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to uh, send me a note on like something brilliant that you saw in my talk or let everybody else know, I am on the Twitter, uh, at RobTree2, you can find me there. I will post the slides later, and you'll see a notice there. Um, if you see something in here you think is horrible and just like, this guy's a fool, he doesn't know what he's talking about, uh, my email address is robert at omniti.com. I strongly uh, would encourage you to write an email, send me all the details of uh, what you think I don't know about and why I'm wrong and how you know that it's better, uh, and then I will totally deal with that in the most appropriate way. Uh, and again, in SlideShare, I'll have the slides online later. Okay? You don't have to write everything down, that will be a little bit tough uh, as we go through this. Um, all right, so testing. Everybody is familiar with testing, at least on some level, I hope. Um, there's a lot you can say about testing. Uh, I think it's probably an internal, you know, it's a, a, an important component of what we do. Um, I would say if I had one word that I was going to use to describe testing, it would actually be required, right? So you have to do some level of testing, and I don't think anyone would really argue against that. But the problem that I see is I think people take that too far, right? Like testing really isn't enough. Uh, when a lot of people get started on projects, especially new projects, or when they're starting like, their business and whatnot, they start thinking about like, what are all the different ways we need to test the software that we're going to have. Right? And we have this sort of mentality that I think sort of grew out of the day when we used to ship like software in boxes, um, that we had to do a lot of testing on that software, make sure it was full proof and that kind of thing. Uh, how many of you do like at least one of these types of testing on the code that you have? Okay, so a bunch of you. How many of you do all four of these things? Okay, like usually there's like one person in the crowd who's like really like test driven development adamant about like testing. Uh, so I got to watch for that guy, but like otherwise. Um, but anyways, so, so there's a lot of kinds of testing you can do, and I, I, you know, depending on how you're building your software or what your software needs to do, some of these are more appropriate than others. Again, the problem that I see is as you start down this path thinking like, well, we're going to have all the testing, right? Some people have gone and tried to do all the testing. The problem is that you end up sort of this false sense of security, right? You start to think that like these tests make me that I am actually covered and that like things are going to be safe. And that's totally not the case, right? When you look at testing and you start thinking about how you build tests, one of the first things that you run smack into is this idea that testing is actually very deterministic, right? When you start to write a test, you're deciding what is it I'm going to test, how am I going to test it, what is the information that will be tested, and, and what use case is going to be there. And that sort of presents a data problem as you build those tests out, right? Data in testing almost never really matches data in production, and certainly the more you scale, the more that's going to be true, right? There's just sort of some very obvious things that sort of hit you in the face, right? Quantity of data, you know, once you hit like 100 million users, the amount of data that those users will generate versus what you're gonna run like on your laptop or even in like a development environment, uh, it's just orders of magnitude different than what you can reasonably deal with, right? Frequency of data along the same lines. You're just generating way more things. Um, we're definitely seeing this in like the IoT space as we start working with folks in that space. We're like, yeah, sure, you can build a thing on your desktop. Right, and see the messages it sends, but then you go deploy like 100,000 of them, and they're sending those messages like every couple of seconds, and like suddenly you have a frequency of data that you just haven't really accounted for in your testing. Right, and then quality of data is also another big problem. Uh, it is really hard to get around. When you're in testing and you're designing those tests, and even if it's a QA department designing those tests, you have control over what that data is going to be. 
right? And that's not always a thing that you have when you get out in public. How many of you heard of Wolf 585? So, so not too many. Okay, so this, this, this guy. Um, so this guy, at one point, he held the record for the world's longest official name uh, in, in sort of the history books. Uh, if you go Google Wolf 585, like you can read his Wikipedia page, uh, the story that his last name tells about him. Uh, and I would posit, you know, how many of you think that if this guy came to register for your service, right, that, that he, he would actually make it through, right? And you all probably have some level of testing, right? There's, like, you think about special characters and that kind of stuff. But I would, I would honestly say, most of the systems I've built, this guy probably gets an error somewhere, because I, I didn't assume he was going to show up, right? So, it's an issue, right? And this is the thing about building web services and things that are going to be consumed by other folks, you know, outside of your organization. Uh, you can't get away from having users, right? And I've tried. I've really tried this in a lot of places. Uh, and it's, it's tough. Um, so you have users. They're always there, right? And in theory, you want more of them at times. You know, you think you do. But no matter how many of them you get, like, they start thinking of weird use cases and other ways to use the systems that you've designed. And you think you know how they're going to use your system, but oftentimes they don't. So, how many of you heard of the Corrupted Blood incident? Okay, so a couple, a couple old school folk. Uh, so, this comes from World of Warcraft, and I'm not a huge like online gamer, but when you get like massive number of people together, it's always interesting the kinds of things that they end up doing. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, and, and so to sort of roughly sum up, uh, the idea was in Warcraft, right? It's sort of like Dungeons Dragons kind of thing. So you have a boss uh, that they introduce in one of the levels, uh, and you could go fight this boss. And he had this special ability that they introduced in the game, which was when he damaged the player, they could get this thing called Corrupted Blood. Uh, and the idea was it would continue to do you damage as a, as a player uh, until you died if you didn't find some way to deal with it. Right? And so this was sort of a new game mechanic that, that the creators thought would be interesting. Um, there were a couple other little things about it, like if your character died, anyone who was standing near you would also get the Corrupted Blood and sort of spread like a plague. Uh, and, and I don't mean that. As, as an over exaggeration. Um, also, just even being near other players in general, like you could get sick and catch this from them, right? So, thinking of it that way. And I think the original idea that people had when they put this into the game was you know, you have to be a high enough level user to be able to fight your way to get to the like dungeon where it is, whatever, and get to the ultimate boss that actually could give you this problem. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully you would know the game well enough to know how to deal with it. Um, unfortunately, somebody knew how to deal with it in a way the original designers didn't think of, which was when they got the Corrupted Blood, they said, you know, I'm not sure how to get rid of this, but probably what I need to do is get around some other people and see if I can give this thing to them. And so they teleported from this dungeon way out of the way where nobody was back into, like, the main town, uh, city where people are, right? <laughs> and so instantly they go back into town and this starts spreading everywhere and, like, now you have, like, sort of, you know, sort of, Intro newbie users who are coming into the game, they're dying like right away because they don't have the ability to withstand this. They don't even know what's going on. No people are starting to quit. Uh, eventually, you ended up with a scene that was really uh, sort of maybe not fun, or right? make the game not fun. Uh, just like massive cities being wiped out because of this thing, and they didn't have any way to stop it because they didn't really ever think this was going to be a problem. Right? Uh, they ended up actually having to shut down servers and like restart them in order to like get the game back up and running in a way that people could play. And so they were like rolling starts of the servers. Like that kind of thing fascinates me. That you know, like you've introduced this thing that you thought was going to be fun, and then you started causing like massive outages within your gaming system, right? And like, oops. So, right? and it's because users, users are very inventive, right? And they'll come up with other things, and this, this is sort of that problem, right? As much as you start to try to think like, well, I know all the use cases because I'm the one who built the system, right? Like, you can never really have enough foresight to understand where this thing is going to go, right? Every time you add another feature, you start adding, like, combinatorial, you know, ways that you can break your system. And it's really hard to keep track of all that, especially as you get other developers involved, and more people ready to scale the organization, less people understand the nuances between different features and how they work, and how those things are going to break, and all of that stuff, you know, just sort of manifests and continues to grow and grow and grow, right? And this is why I say, I don't think testing is a way that you can ever solve this problem, right? They've tried to do that in the past, and we saw with ship software, you know, from 20 years ago, trying to test for every case, and they would do a pretty good job, but it always would still find, you know, somebody's going to find a bug somewhere in that. 
some operating system, some different version of hardware, whatever. Now we have some different version of the browser, some different operating system still, right? It's different mobile client, whatever. All of those kinds of things cause problems. So having tests, if you think that that's the way out, like you're in trouble. And you shouldn't even think that's the way out, right? Like there's not really software that should be written where as a part of that, you would say, my goal in writing the software is to get 100% code coverage, right? Like I suppose it's nice to have if you have it, but like that's not why you're writing the software, right? That's not an end goal of the software system. Um, and so then like maybe there's a philosophical debate to be had, why do you actually do this at all? Uh, and I think that's a bit too extreme. And so what I would always tell people is that to me, if you're going to start out in testing in, the real goal of that testing is that you're trying to win a confidence game, right? What you're trying to really do is think about when I deploy the software, when I start to ship it someplace, I want to at least make sure that like the really simple stuff doesn't get in my way, right? Like I don't get stupid parse errors and that kind of thing uh, that really sort of annoy you when you're like, oh, I left the semicolon out because it was like actually 17 callbacks and not 16 callbacks. Thanks, NimJS. Right? Like all of those kinds of issues, you need to be able to work around. Uh, and that's all just a, a question of how much testing do you need to put in to be confident about what you're going to do. And it's not like 100% like I know this is bulletproof. It's just a reasonable level of confidence that this is going to go out of production. It'll, it'll be fine, right? Like you're not going to instantly break the site. Maybe there is going to be some combination, but like I've kind of looked at how this interacts and I feel pretty good that this will make it out there without causing an outage, right? Reasonably confident. <laughs> not bulletproof, just reasonably confident. If you do that and you think about testing, then I would say it's good for known knowns, right? Those use cases that you're aware of, those are really great. Uh, and I don't know how many of you noticed this particular sign. I thought it was nice. Um, so if you check the elevators up to the third floor, you'll see the sign and the elevators that are there, right? And please do not jump on the elevator. I'm going to say that I'm pretty sure someone somewhere tested to see what happens when people jump in the elevator, right? Because they knew, like, this is a use case. It's not the intended note, but I don't even one of the people here. You should not test this. Someone who is building the elevators actually tested this, right? And it's a use case someone thought of. It isn't actually how they want it to be used, but I'm sure they put a test into it. What I think is actually more interesting about this is that second sentence, right? You will be responsible for damages and repairs, which means at some point somebody realized, like, we can test this all we want, but people are inventive and they will find ways to break things. Uh, and so we're going to put an extra notice in here just in case someone thinks they're going to be creative in the elevator just to let them know. And that to me, like, that sort of thing, right? Like, testing is not so good for those unknown unknowns, right? Like, people might still find ways to break it. Um, they might do it even though you think you've tested against it. They'll realize, like, hey, if I can find, like, the 10 biggest guys at this conference and get them all in the elevator, we may not even have to jump, or maybe only one of them jumps, or whatever, right? Like, you can start experimenting, and you shouldn't. Uh, let me say that again, you shouldn't do that. Um, but I would say that, like, testing is not going to solve that sort of unknown unknowns, right? As people start to get creative with your website and try to jump in the elevator of your, your system. That is where monitoring comes into play, right? I'm pretty sure somebody had some monitoring somewhere. I don't know how you do monitoring elevators per se. Somebody has monitored and seen. They still jump even when they put the sign up telling them not to. Uh, so let's, let's tell them there'll be financial sort of repercussions if they do. So think about, so why do you monitor? Uh, I think probably most people do some level of monitoring. Um, it's scary that I do a fair amount of consulting and like we go into shops where there is shockingly little amounts of monitoring or maybe no monitoring at all, like no actual monitoring system. Um, but obviously there's a lot of reasons you do want to monitor, right? Software isn't perfect. Uh, some people would argue that, that they write perfect software. I argue that they actually cannot, uh, almost by definition. Uh, systems are complex. And we are making them more and more complex by the day. Uh, like, I know, like, Kubernetes and Mesosphere seem very awesome, but they do not seem very simple, right? Uh, especially if you've seen other systems grow and get built. Uh, there's a reason why, like, you know, 100,000 engineering organizations use those software, and it's not because it's easy. Um, external dependencies are always an issue. Uh, if you have something just as simple as, like, like buttons on your website, uh, maybe you, you do, like, some kind of login through third parties. Right, so a lot of people who log into your site or create accounts. Um, if you use S3 for your status signs, right, like that kind of stuff, there's always external dependencies that you don't know are going to work. Uh, and people inherently like to be proactive about these types of things, right? They like to see the problem a little bit before it's really a big problem. Uh, and I, all that is good. I think everybody understands that. Um, I think even though the bigger thing is just that things are always changing in the production environment, right? Like that's one of the things that I think people sort of forget about. 
that like even if you're not changing the code, there's still a lot of other stuff that is probably changing, right? Whether it's new users coming in, old users adding more data, old users finding new ways to use the features you've given them. Um, if it's an IoT thing, again, we're talking to API services, maybe people are turning those on, turning those off, you get like blackouts. Um, that's sort of an interesting one. When you're in like a large enough IoT space and you have a large enough power outage, like all of a sudden you stop getting all your messages. Uh, and if you design your system elastically, like things will spin down, and then suddenly the power comes back on and you get flooded with new stuff coming in, and maybe you don't have enough systems up to actually handle all that traffic anymore, because you slowly scale, as slowly things are rolled out, and now they're all coming at you. Watch out for that. Um, right, so, so you need to monitor. I think everyone will at least agree with that, but then there's the question of, so what do you actually monitor? Right, that is certainly a big question. Uh, and I've seen this as an answer. Um, I have reminded in America we don't have to buy into this, but some people would buy into this. Say, God, we trust all others we monitor. Uh, that's fine, I guess. That's uh, a little bit overboard, but you know, most people sort of go through the checklist of like, what are the systems they have? It's web servers and that kind of stuff. Databases they're going to put monitoring their applications, uh, integration points. Right? There's all these different things. Maybe you want to monitor performance of your system. Like, how long does it take to get time to first byte when somebody goes to your website? That type of stuff. Uh, trying to monitor user behavior. Right. Uh, maybe you monitor, like, if you have, like, a bookmarking feature, how many bookmarks does each user have? Like, at some point, somebody's going to have, like, a billion bookmarks because they're trying to bookmark the entire internet. Um, that may cause you a problem, so maybe you want to see that. Uh, you can monitor all that stuff, and people, you know, certainly as we've built out more automation tools and things like Chef and Puppet, like, people also want to automate adding monitors for all the systems and having that go someplace. Uh, so that anything that gets spun up all of a sudden has, like, tons of metrics, right? Because you really need to know all like 1,000 CPUs that you run across your systems and how hot they are, right? Um, is that enough to monitor all that stuff? I don't know. I think the better question is, is that too much? You really don't need to know the temperature of all your CPUs across a thousand different systems, right? That's probably not actually important. Uh, so what is important if you're going to say like, we believe in monitoring, we understand it's necessary for production, how do I figure out what I should monitor because you're telling me don't monitor everything, right? Uh, and usually the side sort of question of that is like, figuring out what's important to monitor also means figuring out what do we need to alert on, what do we need to like pick people up for, and that type of thing. Um, let me give this example. You may have used uh, this large uh, unnamed messaging service. Um, basically, it sends out messages between people, it does like broadcast, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so it's a messaging system. Um, had this issue where servers were up and running, right? Like you could access, access the website and you could go in and, and like look at messages that you're receiving, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you looked at like the HTTP, HTTP checks that they were running, um, those all returned 200, like everything was fine. Uh, and you'd go in and you would send your message, right? And it would totally say like, yep, got it, I'm sending this out to everybody. And then you sort of wait and you're like, well, nobody's actually getting the message. I don't know where it's going or what it's doing. Um, and like there's discussion amongst like operations people and you look at the services status page and they're like, ah, oh, it's all good. Like, we checked, like, we did, like, little curl action, 200 came back, we know everything's working, right? And this is sort of the thing that, like, if you have that kind of monitoring place, like, if you're, like, kingdom, like, as my homeboy, and, like, I know everything's working because I can ping the site, and it's great. The problem is that servers working doesn't actually mean that your business is working, right? The business of said messaging system is not to, like, ingest the message, it's to actually deliver the message to people. And if you don't actually do that part of it, you don't have a working business. I was sort of fortunate, I guess, uh, to work with a guy who I, I do actually really love and got a lot of wisdom out of this person that was a client of ours, uh, who we once had a debate on whether we needed to be, you know, spending as much time we were, as we were spending setting up monitoring for different systems. And things like CPU temperature came into the, the picture, right? Of like, he's like, why are you automating measuring CPU temperature as a thing? Right? More like, well, you need to know if the box is going to overheat or whatever. Right? And he sort of laid it out very clearly. He was not as concerned about temperature of things as we might have been as engineers. Right? And I look at this and I'm like, well, that's one way to look at it. Right? Like, and what I thought actually, like, well, actually, if the data center was on fire, we probably do want to know that. But he has a definite point. But, right? If the data center being on fire doesn't mean that his business is stopped then like, it's really not like that important of a thing, right? Uh, it would be more important if he couldn't actually continue to make money than if the data center was on fire, right? Because the data center on fire could be like the rack next door or something, right? And like, there's gonna be fire suppression, probably. Um, so, 
you know, I think thinking about it in this way of like, you know, why we are here is to sort of enable businesses and organizations to do things. And what are those things that they do? And that's really the thing we need to start focusing on. Most people I see when they start doing monitoring, right, they get that sort of monitor all the things, right? Like you've all seen that little GIF and like they just go crazy with that stuff uh, and start trying to monitor all the things. And the problem is you end up focusing on the wrong things because there's just so much there and so much you have to actually think about. And you know, I don't necessarily like blame folks for that. Like it's sort of the industry has said this. Um, I would take some level of blame. Like I go and I speak at conferences and like I have said, People have asked me, what should you monitor? And I'm just, monitor all, every, just monitor everything. Like it's, you know, endless amount of metrics. Like this space is cheap, right? Like it's not like we're in the stone ages anymore, just go ahead. Uh, so I've said that kind of stuff. I may or may not throw a little bit of blame on monitoring vendors. Um, not the vendors here, of course, because these vendors are all awesome and they don't have this issue. Um, but there are some monitoring vendors who would, maybe you will note that like their business model, actually they make more money the more metrics you send them. Uh, and so, like, when you're in that sort of weird relationship, probably the answer is monitor all the things, right? Like, it works for them. Um, but we need to be smarter about that, right? We need to be smarter how we talk about monitoring. Uh, and I would sort of throw this out there. The thing about this, when you hear someone talk about monitoring, what they really mean by that, really what they need is observability, right? As a feature of the software and the systems that we run. Right? Most people will use the word monitoring. Observability is really the thing they're looking for. Right? They need to be able to go in and see what's going on. But it doesn't have to be constant. It doesn't have to be all the time. Right? But being able to go figure out, is the software healthy as a thing? Maybe we should say this, right? add observability to all the things. There's really no layer in the stack that you don't want observability. Uh, when you go into like cloud systems like Amazon and whatnot, this is usually one of the most frustrating things. So you get to that point where your observability stops, and then you're sort of upset by that, right? Um, but add observability to all the things that you can possibly get, uh, and then monitor what's going to actually affect your business, right? How do you think about that? I mean, the easiest way is sort of look at it from a top-down approach. Understand what the business is, understand how it makes money, right? understand how it stays in business or, or, or however that, that actually works for your particular organization. Um, define your baselines and correlate data. I'll give you an example of that uh, that, that I think hopefully will help bring that home. Um, so one of the customers that we have, an uh, online marketing company, right? 100 million users or so, who's counting? Um, they send a good billion emails every month. That's a lot of email for 100 million users. It's not a crazy amount of email. Uh, code base of that particular system, like or the set of systems there, it's over 300,000 lines of code, meaning if you have a problem, you don't want to go looking through the code. Uh, we collect about 5,600 metrics across those systems. That's a lot of metrics, I will grant you that. Um, we had an issue, as all issues that are also started with a call. Uh, and so they were looking at the graphs that we have for all these metrics that are out there. Uh, and I think somebody mentioned this, right? You all share all your graphs with everyone in your organization, right? Like not just like the other tech people, like you let even business executives can see all your graphs, right? Okay, I'm not seeing as many like pet shakes as I would hope. You should all do that, figure out a way to let them see it. Um, but we have, a, we have a graph measuring revenue, right? And so they were looking at this graph and they're like, hey, we were looking and it seems like we had a dip in revenue a few days back uh, and we want to know what happened. Like, what, what's the deal there? Uh, and so we started to look around like, okay, well, they're right. There is a graph. It does show a dip in revenue. Um, let's start to look at things. Uh, and so we overlaid traffic graphs, right, for website, for the website on top of this. Uh, and we looked, and we're like, well, actually, that looks about right. It correlates pretty well. Uh, you have a dip in sort of web traffic, ergo, you have a dip in revenue. That doesn't seem too crazy. Uh, they didn't really, like, they didn't really like that answer. Um, so we looked a little bit more. We thought, well, maybe there was something wrong that caused this, like, lowering piece of web traffic, right? And we looked at, like, load times generally seemed like they were okay, right? This is, like, performance of the site um, that was out there. That looked good. And, like, at this point, you're kind of looking at this, you're like, uh, this actually seems like a sales problem to me, not an engineering problem, right? Like less traffic, less revenue, everything in the system is working fine. Um, again, I'm not really happy with that answer. Uh, we continue to look. Um, how many of your developers? They're like, okay, a bunch. Uh, so don't listen to this. Uh, so we employ developers, uh, unfortunately. They seem to be a necessary evil. And as all bright developers will say at some point when you're troubleshooting any issue, I bet it's the database. 
So we overlaid the database graphs as well. We're like, you know, the database, like, you can barely even see. It doesn't even know anything's going on. Uh, and so, like, okay, let's not worry about the database. That's not the issue. Um, so, okay. We actually go through some more overlays and whatnot. We find email bounces are actually the problem, right? They're sending out email to people. They've gotten, like, spam flag or something. And so those emails are now starting to bounce, which means those emails aren't getting through, less people are going to the website, they're not clicking on the sale items and all that kind of stuff, less revenue, right? If we didn't have email monitored, if we collected no metrics on that, I mean, I would say we would definitely do that after this. And I'm sort of scared that somebody probably actually got bit by this and put that metric into place and made a graph on it. Um, but we were lucky in that, like, so having those metrics and having those put into place, those are always good. Uh, the problem that you run into, right, like instrumentation is never done. There's just so many things that you can put that on. Uh, a different example, sort of same symptoms, lower website traffic, uh, you know, but everything looks fine. But we're getting higher decline rates. Uh, that time, like, we called the customer, but they're like, oh, like, we see this problem. We're totally on top of it. And they're like, okay, so what's going on? Like, well, we're seeing more declines on your credit cards. They're like, oh, yeah, well, that's. So we have a dispute with Amex right now and what we should be paying them as a percentage. So like they just blocked us and like we'll figure it out in the next day or two. Don't worry about it. And we're like, well, okay, thanks for letting us know. Um, all right. So you can see that monitoring metrics, all those things are definitely important, right? Like correlating that information, being able to do overlays on graphs, all these good stuff. Tying it back to business and letting your business people see that is good. Um, again, testing and monitoring need to be a thing, right? Uh, it's not testing or monitoring. Uh, understanding the business is a critical component in this. If you haven't thought about how your business stays in business, then one, you know, you're going to make be out of a job at some point. But two, like, start thinking about that now and start thinking about how do you correlate what you're doing to those particular things. Uh, again, add observability to everything, right? When you build software, make sure it says how it's healthy and how it's not healthy, uh, and then monitor the things that are impactful, right? Look at user subscriptions, look at registration, like those types of issues so that you can correlate that back to moves that you're making on the engineering side. Uh, and I will say, at any time that you have a monitoring, uh, it's always worth putting in one particular slide, which is only alert on actionable emergencies. If you're waking people up, make sure it's for something they can actually do something about. Um, please, please, please. Uh, and one other thought, because this is supposed to be about trust, and most of what I've talked about really is not about trust, because trust is a hard thing to get when you're building systems. Um, I would say you cannot trust your computers, right? Like you probably all know this by now, and you cannot trust your users, right? So you better figure out a way to trust your coworkers, right? Because they're all you have left. Thank you.